and Julie Stackhouse. Sure, the mic works. Yes, thank you. I'm not sure about this clicker. I got a little yeah, worried there. The yeah. <laughs> we'll see how. So you guys have gotten a ton on risk and banking from Crandis and Christy. So thank you for that. And I guess Chris lowers. Chris, are you in the room? Let's see, Chris. It's going to tell you all about the Federal Reserve, right? And interest rates. So I guess I don't have to do that. So that's going to leave me with a different topic. I'm going to be your futurist today. You ready for that? Yeah. And I had a lot of help with this, so I think you'll enjoy it. So let's go back. This clicker will work. Okay, maybe in the back of the room you can, there we go. Let's go back to the last time I was able to be here and speak to you, which was in 2015. I think I'm on the four-year rotation. Yeah. Candace, yeah. <laughs> the, the problem with the four-year rotation is, this might be the last one, you never know. <laughs> so, but I was back here in May 7th of 2015 and I made four bold predictions. The first one was the trend in consolidation will continue, but at a slow and steady pace. And then I boldly predicted that community banks, especially in metropolitan areas, would be somewhat larger. Then I said successful community banks will do a better job of integrating technology in order to offer a full array of services to their customers. And finally, that the future look bright for those community banks that are strategic and able to address the challenges successfully. So very bold predictions, right? Okay, quick hand poll. How many think that I was right on all accounts? I don't see every hand in the room. Okay. I know it's bankers, right? I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket, especially with a regulator. I'm going to play it by ear on this one. Well, let's take a look at what really happened. Maybe take a look at what really happened. There we go. There we go. So as Candace showed you, and I'm showing you a different perspective, yes, <clears throat> consolidation has continued. What I think is interesting is that consolidation in Arkansas is really about the level of consolidation that we're seeing across the country. And so you think about it, it happens slowly, you hear about it, but don't really maybe pay too much attention to it unless it happens to affect your market. And yet, then you look at this period of really five, six years, and you go, wow, that is really a significant change. Now, both Candace and Christy talked about de novo banks. I'm going to be the naysayer here and say, I don't think we're going to see a ton of them. And the reason is for the point I'll get into in the future, which is I'm hearing more and more from bankers saying, not so much the physical presence anymore, it's providing the services and leveraging technology to do so. So yes, I was right on that point. Consolidation has continued. And I'm willing to predict to you today that we'll continue to see that over the course of the upcoming years. Of course, the other part of the equation, maybe, <laughs> okay, was our bank sizes increasing. So, Candace, you talked about the level of assets supervised by the state of Arkansas Banking Department. This one just looks at it differently to say, how big is the average bank? And it's bigger. And I think you guys all know that. As consolidation occurs, obviously, the uh, size of the resulting institution is going to be larger. We see it in the banks we supervise. Many institutions are becoming more sophisticated in their operations, and here in Arkansas, they're going out of state as well. That really hit home in St. Louis this last week when the Simmons deal of Reliance Bank closed. The Reliance Bank was a big bank in the St. Louis area. Now Simmons will have a very big presence in the St. Louis area. So the other thing that's occurred I don't think you've missed, but it's good to talk about it from a perspective standpoint, is the fact that at least two large regionals have gotten back in the merger and acquisition game. So there was a drought following the financial crisis where you did not see acquisitions by large institutions, or more than that, mergers of large institutions. And so, you know, you sit there and you scratch your head and you say, wow, is that going to make sense? And quite honestly, what we've seen from a regulatory standpoint is those are tough. 
when you have two large institutions and you're trying to integrate not just operations but culture, it's a challenge. You have to put a lot of management time and attention. And I've even read a little bit about some saying, well, here we are creating another mega giant. And that's the point that I really want to bring some perspective to because if you look at that particular merger and you look at it relative to the really big banking organizations in the US, it's still a pretty small banking organization. Not small, small, but relatively speaking, not up there with the JP Morgan Chase, the cities, and the others. The other piece, though, that I think is important to keep in mind is the world. So if we look at where these organizations fit relative to the world, this is really not working well. I'm hoping that our support in the back can find a way to make this move, thank you, is that even the largest banking organizations in the US are small by world standards. Now, we could quibble a little bit and say, yeah, should the China banks be on there at all? Their government control, maybe that's not a really good comparison. But from the standpoint of what banking organizations in the US, these global SIFIs, look to, they're saying we're relatively small compared to the world. So there's a lot of context here that is important to remember. And certainly as we look at the growth of banking organizations and at their comparative uh, setting within the world environment, we see the US is not ahead in this particular metric. Okay. This, though, I think is intriguing, and it's what I want to spend a lot of my time on today, which is where is technology putting banking? So if you read the Wall Street Journal article on the BB&T and SunTrust deal, what you saw is that the key reason they announced the merger was that it would allow the companies to develop better digital offerings together than they could on their own, making them more attractive to potential customer demands. These guys are big, and yet that was their stated reason for merging. So I think we need to break that apart a little bit and talk about the internet. So what I had my folks do was do a, this very sophisticated analysis. If there are any economists in the room, this is how you do sophisticated econometrics. You go to Google, <laughs> and you put in best banking account. That's all we did. And this is what we found. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just saying this is what we found when we did this. But I think as bankers, it's worth thinking about. I'm going to tell you a little story why. I've got two millennials. I love to talk about my millennials because they pretty much have been very typical throughout you know, their whole lives, including waiting to get married, waiting to buy houses. Good news is they're both buying houses, so I'm really excited that millennials will buy houses. I see a smile there. Um, <laughs> But here was the story of my daughter. So I'm very proud of her. She just finished her master's program at Miller College of Medicine in Houston, and she finished up her residency in prosthetics and orthotics up in Minnesota. So she's working with kids, a lot of kids with cancer, drop foot, um, kids with misshapen heads that need to have helmets made. It's just a very, very cool career, and I'm really proud of her. But she's a very typical millennial. And when she was on my payroll, and she was for a long time, her bank account was with my bank. And that was really cool, because then, you know, as parents, we could watch every single thing she did, so no secrets there. Have any of you done that with your kids? Yeah, I know, we all are kind of the same here. But, you know, she's now on her own, got off my health insurance as of last week. That was sort of the last piece. And she said, well, I think, you know, because I've got the job now, I'm gonna move my bank account up to Minnesota. So that's fine, it's her money. Um, and she said, but, I really only want to move enough into this account for the stuff that needs to be done regularly, like the mortgage payment, you know, those sorts of things, in case there's a problem, because then I can get local help. But the rest of my money, and she's a really good saver, she said, all my friends are saying, go to the internet and find the best rate. It's really easy to do. That is my millennial. And I am willing to guarantee, based on a little survey that I did of the Fed staff here in Little Rock yesterday, it's not just my millennial, it's a lot of millennials. And that really is a thoughtful um, implication for all of you guys. If you do have, maybe you don't, that'd be great, but if you do have this cadre of individuals who are now thinking, not about necessarily what you and I did, I go to the bank because it's, I was so proud to get that passbook savings account 
and just literally having to be able to track what I was able to do, where now they're saying, eh, let's go with what's easiest. So good food for thought as we think about how technology is changing banking. The other thing, and there was um, an article on this, I have not seen the new Fed survey on this, but it's this technology-enabled lending. And here's the bottom line. Small businesses like this. They like technology-enabled lending. Now, it used to be that we would see <clears throat> um, just the lending clubs and those sort of big names out there sitting on the internet, but this is changing very rapidly. So one way to think about it is the Square example. So anybody heard of Square? Like your small businesses all use it for payments, right? Maybe a lot. Well, Square is a creation of, well, the real uh, thought behind it came from a guy named Jim McKelvey. He's on our head office board of directors. And Jim was a hot glass blower while he was a student at Washington University in St. Louis. He had a very big piece of glass. It was worth about $2,000, and he had a buyer for that piece of glass. But the buyer only had a card. And this glass factory only took cash and checks. The buyer didn't have it. So Jim McKelvey lost the sale. That was the impetus for Square. Finding a swipe product for small businesses that was less costly than what small businesses were using at the time. Okay, fine, but what has Square done? Square has now gathered cash flow data from small businesses, and they are able to lend through Square Capital. Using algorithms, artificial intelligence basically is a set of algorithms using big data and fast computing power, they're now able to provide credit to small businesses. And that is the change that is occurring. It's not just the lending clubs. It is the next type of lender that is available to these small businesses, and that's growing. So thus far, we've seen it largely in the personal space, the small business space, and the student loan space. Student loans, of course, are just really interesting since so many are government-backed student loans, but there's a group of individuals who really like the option of refinancing on the internet Maybe, maybe not getting a better rate than they did on their government loan, but certainly being able to connect to a social network where they're now able to meet people and other things that are certainly important to that particular generation. So a lot happening there. The other thing that I think is really useful, and this comes from S&P, is the projections on how it will increase. It's gonna grow, we think it's gonna grow. I was able to visit with a group of small business administration lenders a couple months ago, through their um, umbrella organization, the National Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders, and I think you probably will have this experience. They said to me, we don't get it. They're going to the internet. They could be going to an SBA loan, and it would be better off. And my comment was, it probably would. But if you think of it through the lens of the small business, many small businesses, maybe not your customers, they are really, really working hard during the day and they might be able to do their loan application at midnight, and of course, they probably want to do it online. So if that relative ease of use is more important to them than what might be a better rate, then that's maybe where they're gonna go. A lot to think about there, though. Even though we see this happening very quickly, we have to keep perspective that there's a lot we don't know about technology-enabled lending. And importantly, how will those algorithms work in a changing economic environment? We already think about how do those algorithms work for things like fair lending. We already think about where does this data go? Where is it being aggregated? Is it sitting in Plaid, one of the large data aggregators? Did, they, did your customer just give away their logon ID and password so that data could be aggregated? These are all real issues that are sitting out there today, and I'll put a little plug in for the Ask the Fed series on FinTech. We're gonna cover all of these in that series. But at the end of the day, this idea of will credit be available in economic downturn is really not getting a lot of attention, and I worry about that. We did have a discussant, a banker, at our community bank research conference last fall, and she talked about the wildfires in California and how online lenders were very big in that area, and when the wildfires went through, the algorithms basically said no more credit. And those small businesses did not have credit to meet their payrolls or for other needs, and they went back to the banks, which was great, right? 
but think about this from the standpoint of something that's not local, that's bigger. But this is out there and it's very real relative to the banking environment. So with FinTech comes many risks that you will have to think about. I, along with Candace, and I'm sure Christy and others would say, do think about this, it's important, it's coming at you. It's really not scary in the sense it's just the next layer of banking. Technology is becoming part and parcel to people's lives. So they will be interested at some point <clears throat> in having technology in their banking services. But there are many things you're gonna have to think about and understand. Certainly the cyber risk that was discussed earlier. Technology increases your cyber footprint. <clears throat> it means that you need to think about that in your cyber risk management. Model risk and third party risk. So very traditional banking risks, you create the model, you need to validate the model, or you purchase from a vendor, you need to understand what the vendor is doing as part of your third party risk management. This is really hard to do sometimes because I will be the first to tell you that if someone gave me that printout of all the algorithms, my eyes would glaze over and my head would hurt. But I do think we will see more bank coalitions in this regard where banks come together to look at the risk in these uh, models when they are purchased from a third party. Liquidity risk, that risk is gonna be out there. It might be, seem a little odd, how will liquidity risk be there? But I've just offered to you this idea of my daughter going to the internet to be able to transfer, to save money at a higher rate of interest. In this room, I know there are individuals that are today looking at online banking options. Um, so basically being able to create a quote unquote bank, it's really just a unit of your own bank, usually with a different name, but on the internet, so when my daughter Googles, your name will pop up. And it makes sense, even though it's at very high interest rate accounts usually, there's no overhead associated with them. It makes sense. But let's think ahead two or three or four years. As the competition grows, think about the rate sensitivity and ultimately the liquidity sensitivity that will occur if you don't keep that rate competitive with others on the internet. So this is really meant to be food for thought, but certainly it's a very traditional risk. Privacy, I just mentioned a little bit. More and more we're gonna hear about things um, such as your customers, as I said, giving away their login ID and password. By the way, they usually hit a disclosure saying they know they're doing that, but who reads those disclosures? <clears throat> and we will see technology change. We will see use of more technology that just passes the information from your bank to a data aggregator so that privacy is more contained. But there's still unanswered in issues in the United States about privacy, data privacy. Do we need a GDPR-like law in the United States where individuals are better able to control what is kept by others relative to their information and greater clarity and how does it go away? So all too often, individuals are willing to give their login ID and password but not ask the question, if I don't use this service anymore, where does my information go? So I do think that will be one of those ongoing risks. And then, as I mentioned, credit, the fair lending. How do we know that the algorithms are fair? You test them and you back test them, and the vendors come in and they talk to us and they say, it is fair. Here's how I back tested the algorithm. And I can say it's not, but we haven't been through cycles yet, particularly economic cycles. So really understanding how the algorithms will work is unknown. So these are some of the risks I wanted to point out there. And really, to get to say, well, you're probably saying you're, you were being a futurist and I thought this was gonna be fun. That doesn't sound like good news. So why did I title this presentation? Community Banking in Arkansas, it is the future. And here's why. Despite all these challenges, you have a comparative advantage. And that is you. That is your employees. And that's what you do for your community. And I'd like to share that with some stories. Ah. First of all, we talked about bank mergers and what they're doing. But here in Arkansas, it looks different. As we see mergers occurring in many states, banking is being purchased by out-of-state entities. In Arkansas, you have the reverse. You are buying your partners. Now, you could say that may be good or that may be bad or I don't know how to think about it, but it sure feels a lot different to your customer 
when a neighboring institution merges with another institution and it's kept local versus the out-of-state. So I do think that is a comparative advantage. The other thing is you build your communities. And I think the best way to talk about how you build your communities is to hear it from some folks in the room. So where's Gary? Okay, let's hear what Gary has to say. Service is their number one, uh, number one attribute. Uh, quality service and a service that our customers look for. Uh, you know, there's, you hear people at the rec shop all the time. Uh, typically in our customers regularly come up to the fourth or fifth question when it comes to phone. They are wondering if we think this is a good move for them personally and for their business. Uh, is this something I should do or is this something I should stay away from? Yeah, you are the advisor to your communities. How powerful is that? It's tough to get on the internet. All right, Marnie. Let's see what Marnie has to say. You know, it's a given, I guess, that we do provide financial services. And as we do those, uh, particularly on the loan side, you know, you're giving them the capital they need to grow. But I think that in addition, just those volunteer hours and donations that they give to the those, everyone within the community succeed together. So uh, community banking in Arkansas just can't be underestimated in its overall value, not just for just stimulating jobs because it keeps the company going, but also just in making the whole community a better place to be. Yeah, the value proposition, making your community a better place to be. Okay, our third story. Jeff? Yeah, you better raise your hand. Let's see what Jeff has to say. The local county hospital here in Keeper Springs was at a point a number of years ago where it could no longer meet its payroll. And when the bank became aware of it, we put together a loan that would certainly help that payroll be met and met for a period of time. So the hospital was clearly struggling and we created a bridge loan that gave the hospital time to really find Yeah. Jeff, you think an online lender's going to do what your bank did? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Pretty powerful. So the third thing that I would offer to you is the traditions here in Arkansas, that they are strong and unique. So a few more stories in that regard. Cave City, Arkansas. One of the things I've had the pleasure of doing is travel a lot in Arkansas, and I've been to Cave City. I know no one is here from Cave City. I know that there's an examination going on in Cave City, so my apologies to those folks. Um, but went, <laughs> went to visit the bank and learned that Cave City is home to what? The world's sweetest watermelon. So this was great, and we went and visited with the bank. Um, they were a new member bank, talked about the Fed membership and all that sort of stuff. And at the end of it, we're presented with a platter of the world's sweetest watermelon. So I like watermelon, but you know, first my first thought was, can we do this? We have these limits on how much you know we can. <laughs> anyway, got over that quickly, and it really enjoyed it. Really, really enjoyed it. At the time, I was traveling with Dennis Blaze, who is now retired. Anybody know, remember Dennis Blaze? Yeah, people are like, oh yeah, that guy. So the way that we worked this out in our travels was really cool. Dennis drove and I worked, right? Good, good uh, delegation of duties, he could drive, I could work. So we left Cave City and we're driving down the road and I'm on the phone talking to someone and there is a watermelon stand, right? So I'm like, get out, pull in there! And sure enough, he did the hard right turn, we pulled into the watermelon stand. We selected two of Cave City's finest watermelon, you know, the old you knock on it and you get that hollow sound. And because we had our own car and we wanted to be very careful, we took those watermelons and we buckled them in the back seat, in their own seat belts, <laughs> drove them back to St. Louis and shared them with everyone. And what a great memory of the town of Cave City. Of course, there are other stories out there. Where's my Centennial Bank, folks? 
I know there's got to be someone here from Centennial. Well, they're not going to raise their hand anyway. So in our outreach program, some of you may be aware of them. From time to time, we go to banks and we do webinar programs. My uh, gift, I guess if you could term it such, I called it my host gift, was to give my skill of, I think skill, of doing stained glass. I'm really proud of being able to do stained glass, and I love to give it away, give it away to charitable events. I don't really keep any of it. So when we Googled Conway, of course, what did we find as really one of the hallmarks of Conway, Arkansas? Toad Suck Days. Okay, so anyone know why Toad Suck Days exist? You're not going to raise your hand. I just want to do a little lesson here so you know about Toad Suck Days. Because this is kind of cool. All right. According to Google, my favorite source, um, long ago, steamboats traveled the Arkansas River when the water was at the right depth. When it wasn't, the captains and their crew tied up to wait where the Toad Suck Block and Dam now spans the river. While they waited, they refreshed themselves at the local tavern to the dismay of the folks living nearby. He said, they suck on the bottle till they swell up like toads. <laughs> Hence the name Toad Suck. So now you all know that and another legacy of Arkansas. And finally, Citizens Bank of Batesville. So this story is a Dennis Blaze story and it goes something like this, but I think it talks about these incredible strong community connections that you have. So the story goes that our examiners back in the day, we're talking about doing electronic exams now. Well, back in the day, we did surprise exams, right? You didn't get to any word of it until our folks showed up. Well, back in the day, our examiners went to this bank, and the president said, well, I've been expecting you. So that was a little puzzling. This was a surprise exam. The next sentence was, my brother is the owner of the Mattel in town. And when you all booked your rooms in the motel, he let me know. So that is Arkansas. <laughs> it's great. It's great. We learn a lot from you about that strength of those relationships. So the other thing that I think is what you do for your communities. These are all the places I've been in Arkansas over the years. And what I want to do is show you in these communities who you are by what you have put on your social media. Those other pictures are really there. I don't know why they didn't show up. They showed up yesterday in the practice session. So if you want to look at what's online, you can see them. This is you. This is what you're showing the public. And isn't that powerful to be able to see what you're able to do through the relationships in your community? I don't know how an online lender will compete with that. You, 
with, with what you bring in your legacies. I did intentionally include Rennie Rutledge there, who I understand is not showing up for the panel on the next session because he's ill today. But the fact that we have family legacies yet in Arkansas is very powerful. I'm very convinced that Arkansas will weather these changes ahead. And I think this says it all. A bold past, a bright future. So congratulations to all of you for being what you are to your communities and being the future of Arkansas.